Okay, Hazak Baruch and good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Wednesday morning as we are getting ready for, Pera, for Pesach. Okay, Perashat Pesach. Okay, and uh, today's uh, class is sponsored anonymously for the Refuah Shalema of all of Am Yisrael. Hashem should bless our sponsor with all the amazing blessings of our Torah. Amen. If anybody would like to sponsor a class, please email us info at ejsny.org. Rabotai, please grab a Haggadah. And today I would like to share with you a beautiful idea on one of the paragraphs that we're not going to often uh, hear a rabbi speak about when he's getting up there to give a sermon. If I were to ask you, who is the main villain of the holiday of Pesach? Okay, please feel free to write in your answers. It should be a pretty easy one. Who is the villain of Pesach? We know every holiday has a villain. Every Spider-Man has a villain. Every holiday has a villain. Who is the villain of Pesach? The villain is Paro, right? I hope that's what you guessed. Paro. Well, we take a look into the Haggadah. It's in the middle of the Magid. We have a paragraph over here. Tse ulmad. Go out and learn. Mabikesh lavan ha'arami la'asot le'yakov avinu. Says the Haggadah. By the way, I want you to go out and check and see that Lavan, look what he tried to do to Yaakov Avinu. And he was actually, you'll find, worse than Paro. In what way was he worse? She Paro lo gazar ela ala zecharim. Paro only had a decree against the males. Ve Lavan bikesh la'akor et akol. Lavan tried to uproot everybody. Lavan tried to destroy male and female. And therefore, Lavan's worse than Paro. She ne'emar. And by the way, continues the Haggadah. You're looking for a proof? You want to know, where does it say that he tried to destroy everyone? Right here. Arami Oved Avi. The Pasuk says, in, uh, in Devarim, Arami Oved Avi, that in Aramean tried to destroy my father. Of course, the Arami, the Baal Haggadah's understanding in this context is referring to Lavan. Lavan tried to destroy Yaakov. And therefore, Vayered Mitzrayma, Yaakov had to go down to Egypt. And he lived there until he became a great nation, period. End of paragraph. What in the world is going on over here? Okay, let us ask some questions. Let's first summarize what we just read. We just read how Lavan is worse than Paro. Paro is not so bad. Lavan is worse because Paro, he tried killing the males. Lavan tried killing the male and the female. Like it says in the Pasuk, in Arami, tried to destroy my father. And that eventually caused... Uh, Yaakov to want to go down to Mitzrayim. I have a lot of questions over here. Number one, what is this language? Tseumad, go out and learn. Go out and read. Go out and find out. What, what do you mean? Where? Where exactly am I supposed to go and, and learn? Isn't that why I'm reading the Haggadah? Isn't that your job, Mr. Haggadah, to teach me what, is, what exactly I need to know? So that's question number one. Seulmad, go out and learn, and then you'll see. Well, where go? Why? Why? Why can't you tell me? Question number two: What in the world does this mean? Paro's not so bad. <laughs> Are we watering down Paro's wickedness? Is that? I think this is the wrong place to do that. This is, after all, the Haggadah. I don't think we're supposed to take away the spotlight from Paro. You know, I know Paro would be very happy right now by listening to this. You know, the, the, Paro, if he was at the Seder, he would say, yes, thank you. Thank you for making me not so look so bad compared to Lavan. Love you guys. <laughs> but I think that's a mistake. I think we're supposed to say how bad Paro was. What exactly are we doing here? By shifting the screen to Lavan, Lo, Lavan was worse. Maybe, maybe. But uh, Esav was also bad. I don't know. Haman was also bad. Are we comparing villains? Is that what we are here to do? Are we trying to compare who was worse? You know, it reminds me of the famous joke. This uh, man passes away and this guy was crooked. Nobody liked him. And at his funeral, unfortunately, nobody had any positive things to say. So everybody gets up there and they start, you know, bashing the guy. He was crooked. He was an animal. He is a stealer. He owes me money. His father owes us money. Boom, boom. You know, everyone's saying, you know, bad thing after the next. And the rabbi, out of pure pity... The rabbi, is, is the guy's body is not even cold yet. The rabbi is trying to find, so the rabbi gets up and he says, please, does anyone have anything nice to say? And the lady in the back says, yeah. The rabbi says, please, bechavot. She goes, his brother was worse. 
right? So, what kind of business is this? We're, uh, we're saying, you know, Paro's not so bad because Lavan was worse. Okay. And Paro is, the, is still bad. Paro's, are we trying to, we're trying to water down how bad Paro is? That's question number two. Number three, you know, where exactly does Lavan try destroying Yaakov? It's not so simple. If you read the story, where exactly does that happen? He tried, uh, he tried destroying Yaakov Avinu. By the way, the text, Arami Oved Avi, is not Pshat. The Pshat of the Pasuk in Aramean, who was Oved, was my father. That means, the way that uh, the Ibn Ezra understands it, that's it's saying the following. My father was a lost wanderer. My father was lost. He was traveling. He didn't have a place to go. That's how the Ibn Ezra. The Rashbam understands it similarly, but instead of Yaakov, he says it's talking about Avraham. Avraham was a lost wanderer. But both understand the word Oved as lost. They were lost. Over here, the Balagada is saying over here is stretch. He's saying Oved means to destroy. An Aramean tried to destroy my father, Avi. And if that's the case, where does he get this from? Where is, does it say that anywhere in the text? Yes, we know Lavan tried to destroy, to, he tried running after Yaakov to kill him. But at that point, Yaakov had kids. He had family. Did he want to kill his grandkids? Was Lavan intending to kill his own grandkids? Rachel's own children? Leah's own children? It's hard to, to believe that. So where do we find Lavan trying to kill Yaakov Avinu? Okay, both male and female. Very hard to understand. Also, I mean, after all, once, once we're comparing, Esav definitely was someone who tried to kill Yaakov. Why don't we throw him into the mixture of here? You may as well. Esav also tried to destroy my father. Esav tried killing Yaakov. Esav's the first villain. Okay? Why are we referring, another question, why are we referring to Lavan as an Arami, as an Aramean? Since when does the Pasuk ever call him that? Call him by his name. He has a name. It's Lavan. That's, a, that's how the text refers to him at least. So use Lavan. What's Arami? And finally, finally, look at the Pasuk one more time. It says, Arami of Edavi, an Aramean tried to destroy my father. And therefore, Vayered Mitzrayma. What does that mean? And therefore, my father went down to Egypt. Is that true? Is that how things happen in, uh, in sequence of order? Did Yaakov go down to Egypt after he left Lavan's house? No, he didn't. Where did Yaakov go when he left Lavan's house? Anyone know? Lavan, Yaakov runs away. And where does he go? <laughs> he goes back to Israel. Yaakov goes back to Israel. He hangs out in Israel for many, many, many good years. It was only after Yosef was sold. And then he went down to Mitzrayim. If you read this Pasuk and you didn't know anything about Tanakh, if you didn't know Chumash, if you didn't learn the story of Yosef, if I were to ask you, where, how did the Jewish people end up in Egypt? You would say, well, Lavan tried to kill us, so we ran to Egypt. Because that's what it says in the Pasuk. Arami oved avi vayered mitzrayma. So what exactly is going on? Okay? To understand this Pasuk, again, I think it's a lot of nice questions. And it's a paragraph that we usually won't spend a lot of time on in the Haggadah because I think a lot of us feel, feel like it's not really an important part of the story. It's not, it's not the main thing. Whether or not you understood this paragraph, I don't think is going to change your understanding of the Pesach story. I think we, we would rather much spend a lot of more time on the four sons, on the Manishtanas, on the questions, on the Dam Tzfardeyas, on the Dayenus, Right? Those are paragraphs that we focus on. This paragraph, I think, if a guy says, Rabbi, I can't, I don't know, I feel horrible. I don't know if I fulfilled my obligation of the seder. I didn't understand the paragraph of Tse'umad, Mabikesh Lavana Arami. I think the rabbi would say, listen, it's okay. <laughs> I think, uh, did you say Pesach Matzan Maror? Did you understand? Did you ask questions? Did you think Hashem did with the Dayenus? I think you're okay, right? I think most people would, would agree to that. However, ladies and gentlemen, this paragraph is in the Haggadah, and we have to understand A, why, and B, all of the other questions that we asked 
uh, just now. I would like to share with you a beautiful idea from Rabbi Bernstein on his uh, Haggadah here. He has a beautiful idea, and it goes back to something that we mentioned in a prior class, and that is, why did Hashem put us in Mitzrayim to begin with? Why did we go down to Egypt? You know, we gave a mashal in the other class the other day. Imagine a person breaks your ribs and you go to a doctor to heal you and the doctor fixes your bones. You're very appreciative. You send the mishloach manot. Thank you, doc. Really appreciate it. But let's say the guy who broke your ribs was the doctor. Are you going to still thank the doctor? I think our attitude towards the doctor is going to be very different. You're crossing the street and all of a sudden a guy recklessly hits you with his car. He turns out to be a great surgeon and he fixes you up. He heals you. You're going to still thank him? Of course not. You're lucky if I don't sue you. What in the, what in the world is this? We're thanking, the, we're thanking Hashem for taking us out of Egypt. Yeah, but you put us in. Says it by Bernstein. It's true. Hashem did put us in. But imagine the doctor who breaks your bones, breaks your bones because he has to get to a sickness that you have much, much deeper in that's much more severe. So now you understand that the doctor who broke your ribs, he did so so that he can heal you. So now, yes, you do thank the doctor for breaking your ribs. We have to realize, Rabotai, that when Hashem put us in Egypt, it's because we as a nation, we were broken. We had a sickness. We were sick. We had in our genes bad DNA. We had DNA from Terach, who was an idolater. We had genes from Lavan, who was our grandpa in a weird way, right? Lavan was our grandpa. He was Rachel and Leaz mom. So we have to remember that in our genetic code, there was corruption. And Hashem knew that this nation will not be able to stand the test of time. We had to go through the fires of Egypt. The Pasuk calls Egypt a kurha barzel, a smelting furnace. You know what a smelting furnace does? You take a piece of metal, you put it over the fire, and the fire removes all the admixtures, all the impurities that are in the metal. And this is what Egypt was all about. The goal of Egypt was for us to go through it, the hot fire, the slavery. And you know what it did? It decomposed us in order to reconfigure our genetic code. And we came out with beautiful DNA. We came out a nation that was ready to receive the Torah, something that we wouldn't have been able to do before we went into Egypt. So we don't only thank Hashem for taking us out of Mitzrayim, but we thank Hashem for putting us in. And that was yesterday's class. And that's why we say a bracha on the maror. What's maror? Bitter. Why are you saying a bracha on something bitter? The answer is, we thank Hashem even for the bitter experiences because we look back in life sometimes and we realize that the adversity that we faced, the struggles that we had, the pain that we experienced are the things that made us into the successful people that we are today. Our experiences, our tribulations, our mishaps, they taught us empathetic and em empathy. They made us resilient. They build our character. And we look back and we say, thank you, Hashem. Even ma'asuhabonim. These stones that the builders refused are one day going to be cornerstones. They're going to be on the Hayata Lerosh Pina. And we're going to look back and thank Hashem for putting us through the fire and the slavery of Egypt. Because just like a seed before it could become a flower, the seed has to first decompose and disintegrate. So too the Jewish people had to break down and then rebuild. We had to hit rock bottom, so to speak. And that's what Egypt was. That was yesterday's class. But my friends, is there a proof for all of this? How did God know? I mean, He is God. But uh, was there no chance? Was there something that caused God to see and decide, wow, I need to, uh, I need to throw them into Egypt. They're not going to last in this dangerous world of pagan and, and immorality and uh, dishonesty. I need, to, uh, I need to rebuild them from scratch. Did, it, did God see something that caused them to realize this? And the answer is yes. The answer is Hashem saw what happened to Yaakov Avinu. Says the Haggadah, Tseumad, go out and study about what happened to Yaakov and you'll see something that's very scary. 
You know, Yaakov Avinu is in, is in uh, Lavan's house. And we know Lavan, Arami, doesn't like Yaakov. He's very jealous of him. You know, if you were a CEO of a company and there's somebody that you don't like, what do you do? What would you do if you didn't like one of your uh, workers? He was, he was too good. He was competition. What would you do? I think, right? If you would fire them, get a different job. Sorry, this, this town ain't big enough for the two of us. There's only one sheriff in this town, my friend. Right? We would kick him out. Right? There's somebody else that's doing very good and they're very popular. And you see it a lot of times. You see it in politics. You see it in different uh, settings. Lavan. You don't like Yaakov Avinu? Kick him out. Send him home. But he never does that. It's very interesting. We see actually Lavan does the opposite. He tries as much as possible to keep Yaakov. Please stay. Don't go. Uh, I'll do whatever you, whatever you need. Work for me for another seven. Work, work more. Why? Why? He never once says to Yaakov, please leave. That's what I would do if I was Lavan. You know why? Lavan, you know why he doesn't like Yaakov? Because Yaakov is an ish emet. Yaakov is honest. And Lavan is the opposite of Yaakov. Lavan is someone who is crooked. Lavan is sneaky. Lavan has no integrity. And Lavan can't live knowing that there are people in the world like Yaakov Avinu. I can't. And Solon the Yaakov is alive. You see, Lavan knows. You send him home, it doesn't matter. It's going to be that conscious. It's going to be there gnawing at him. Eating up at him. So what does Lavan decide to do? There's only one way to settle his miserable Feelings of being dishonest. And that is, like they say in English, misery needs company. And Lavan decides once and for all, he's going not to kill Yaakov. Because that's not going to help. Because he dies an honest person. He needs to corrupt Yaakov. His goal, he has one goal in mind, and that is to make Yaakov like him. If I can make Yaakov also corrupt, that's it. And that's why you see a lot of times people that are, uh, that are broken, you see it all the time, that they have bad habits. They try to make other people pick up those bad habits because now misery needs company. And in life, we, we had a class on this many times. Sometimes in life, we pull down the people around us because now I all of a sudden feel better about myself. That's why so many times people like degrading the avot. They like talking bad negatively about all the holy peoples in our history. Why? Because if, if I can pull them down, then I feel good about my lack of integrity, my lack of honesty. And this is what yeah, Lavan tries to do. He's haunted by the fact that Yaakov is so moral. And therefore the solution is he has to corrupt Yaakov. And that's why he keeps him there hoping with time. You are, you are, you are influenced by your surroundings. And actually... It almost works in a scary way. Yaakov almost becomes like Lavan. It's, he starts rubbing off on him. Matter of fact, our rabbis explain that after 20 years of spending in Lavan's house, Hashem says, Yaakov, I need you to go home. I need you to go home. And they want to know why, what happened, what changed. And if you look in the text, you only find one thing. You find that right before Hashem sends him to go home, you read how Yaakov has these dreams with the sheep and how they're, they're leaning against the rods, spotted rods, uh, striped rods, brown rods, different colors, different shapes. And Hashem says, our rabbis tell us, Yaakov, look what happened to you. 20 years ago, what were you dreaming about? On the way down to Lavan's house, you were dreaming about angels. You were dreaming about Sulam Mutzav Arta, a ladder going up to the heaven. You were dreaming about spirituality. And now look at you. What are you dreaming about now? 20 years later, you're dreaming about sheep. You're dreaming about money. Lavan has slowly corrupted you, Yaakov, to a certain degree, to a small level. Therefore, time to go home quickly before you change and you become like him. Actually, the Kutzker says that Yaakov Avinu 
probably means this when he calls his wives that night and he says it's time to go. And what does he say to them? I see that your father's face to me is not the same as yesterday. It's not the same. On a simple level, Yaakov was telling his wives, I see that your father's attitude is changed. He's more aggressive. I see he starts to not like me. I'm afraid he's going to kill me. We got to leave. But says the Kutzker, that's not what Yaakov meant. Yaakov says, your father's face to me no longer seems, no longer looks like the same evil, corrupt, sneaky, sly person that he was when I came. When I came many, many years ago, I saw your father for the crooked person he was. But now it's starting to change. All of a sudden I'm becoming tolerant of your father. All of a sudden he's not so bad. And if that's the case... I think it's time that we better head home. He's starting to rub off. He's taking his toll. It's a beautiful story of a Talmud who moved into one of the towns in New York before the, uh, the new square town of Hasidim was built. And he was living with many Goyim, amongst many non-Jews. And he went to his Rebbe, he said, Rebbe, I'm very worried, I'm very nervous, raising my kids next to Goyim. I'm, uh, I'm uh, afraid what's going to happen. And the Rebbe said, don't worry, it'll be okay. A month later, he comes back. He says, Rabbi, I'm so nervous. I don't know. The rabbi says, don't worry, it's going to be okay. He comes back. Rabbi, I think I should move. It's, it's scary. The rabbi says, don't move. It's going to be fine. Okay. After a few times, he stopped coming to his rabbi. And six months later, the rabbi saw the student and he says, "No, how's it going? He says, Baruch Hashem, everything's going okay. It's, um, it's fine over here. Everything's working out. Business is good. And the rabbi says, by the way, I just wanted to tell you, it's time for you to leave. And the student's like, what? I don't understand. I'm asking you every time, every month. I'm, I'm, I'm double checking. And all of a sudden, now you want me to leave? After I establish my business? And the rabbi says, every time you came and you asked me, I saw that you were afraid to stay. I knew it was okay for you to stay. But now that you're no longer uncomfortable, now that you're no longer scared, that's exactly when you should be scared. Now I'm afraid for you. If you're no longer if you're no longer afraid of staying, that means you already became tolerant. That means they already slowly started corrupting you. You became a little bit like them. Now it's time to go home. Like Yaakov Avinu. Unbelievable. We say in the Haggadah, Bechol Dor Vador, Omdim Alenu Lechalotenu. In every generation, they try to kill us. And the question is asked, is that true? Do they really try to kill us in every generation? Have there not been generations that have been very kind to us? Take a look in America today. Does the government not give us rights? Are we not allowed to worship? We have security. We could parade for Israel. Has there ever been a better country than America? Maybe we should delete this line. Have there not been centuries, many decades, that people have not tried to destroy us? Is it true that every generation? What is the Haggadah saying? But maybe, maybe, the Haggadah is saying that sometimes they try killing us with a sword and sometimes they try killing us with a smile. But either way, it is a destruction that we have to remember is a, is a omdim aleinu lechalotenu. We have to be very, very careful. We must beware of the sword of Esav and we must beware of the kiss of Esav. And Lavan, in the way the Haggadah says, is worse than Paro. Paro only tried killing us physically. Lavan Lavan tried to destroy everything, our physicality and our spirituality. That's why Esau is not here. We're not talking about a physical destruction. We're talking about a spiritual holocaust. We lost more Jews in the campuses than in the camps. There was once a rabbi visiting from Europe and he was staying by a local rabbi's house. And the rabbi, the host, Offered his guest a cup of coffee. He says, yes, please. Would you like some milk? He says, is the milk halav Israel? He says, no, it's halav stam. The rabbi says, well, in that case, I'll pass. I'll just take the black coffee. The next day, the rabbi, the host, comes again to his guest and he offers him another cup of coffee. And the guest rabbi asks, yes, please, thank you. Does it have, uh, would you like some milk? And the guest rabbi asks back, is it halav Israel? And the host rabbi says, no, it's halav stam. And the guest rabbi says, well, I told you yesterday, I only drink halav Israel." And the host rabbi told him back, yes, rabbi, but I thought already one day in America, 
and you'll already start drinking regular chalav, regular chalav stam. This is the, we are a product of our surroundings, Rabotai. We do conform. And we have to realize that so long that we're uncomfortable, then that's okay. But once we start getting comfortable where we are, once we're okay with our neighbors, that is when Lavan smiles. That is when the kiss of Esav is slowly penetrating with its venom and it's destroying the Jewish people. You look around at what's happening today. In America, no one's trying to kill us. Not physically, at least. But there are many Jews dying. Look at the assimilation rate. And you tell me, is this not also omdim alenu lechalotenu? When the king of Russia sends a letter to his nephew, the czar of Prussia at the time, and he says, why are you so nice to the Jews? His nephew responded, my dear uncle, you kill the Jews your way, and I will kill the Jews my way. So this is what Lavan is doing here in the Haggadah. Lavan tried destroying Yaakov Avinu spiritually. And now we understand what's the sequence of the Pasuk. Arami Oved Avi, and that's why, by the way, it refers to him as an Arami. It doesn't call him Lavan. It calls him Arami Oved Avi. An Aramean. But why? Why do we call him Lavan? Because the whole point is Lavan as an Arami. It wasn't Lavan. Lavan was trying to corrupt Yaakov and turn Yaakov into an Arami, into an Aramean, to adopt the cultures of the society around him. And what was the result? If, when Hashem sees, if this is the case with Yaakov Avinu, Kalva Homer, his descendants, and Hashem knew he had to send us into Misraim. Says the Pasuk, because Arami, because an Aramean almost destroyed Yaakov, he was almost successful. Therefore, Vayered Mitzrayma, not the next year, not the next, uh, n- next month. It didn't happen right away. But Hashem, as a result of this, Hashem knew you need to go down to Egypt. We have to go down there like we explained, so that we can reconfigure our DNA, so that we can go through the smelting furnace, through the Kura Barzel of Mitzrayim. So the Pasuk is not sequential, but it's causational. Because of this, that happened. If Yaakov couldn't pass, so for sure Hashem knew that we wouldn't be able to, to either. And this, this is, I think, something that is so important for us to, uh, to remember. The rabbis, the halakha, the Torah, places for us certain restrictions to keep us separated from the goyim. We cannot eat certain foods. We cannot drink wine. These are all there to create a fence. How foolish is a parent who allows their children to break all of these fences and all of a sudden their child is 20, 25 and they're dating a non-Jew and they come crying to me, Rabbi, Please talk to my son. They want a date to go, yeah, they're getting married. Talk to him. For 25 years, you did zero. And now you want the rabbi to come fix it in, uh, in two hours, in one class. Are you out of your mind? We have to make sure we set up the fence way, 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 way before they're dating. Or else we cannot wake up when it's too late. Here, rabbi, fix my son. We raise the glass and what do we say? This is what saved us so that we shouldn't get destroyed by the non-Jews. What saved us? What's vehi? What? It, we say, and this saved us. What? What's this? The answer is this glass that we're raising. This cup of wine that we make sure not to drink with non-Jews. This saved us. Because of this glass of wine, we are still here today. These fences that our rabbis put are genius. They are brilliant. We follow the halakha. We follow the guidelines. We will be able to survive and we will come out like uh, Yaakov. We will stay unassimilated. So I think this is a very important pasuk, a very important paragraph to understand and to really internalize, especially today, today that we're so comfortable. Baruch Hashem, we don't have the sword of Esav down our throats, but we have to be very careful not to become swallowed into the culture of the world around us.
because our values are not always in line. Our mitzvot that we have and the mitzvot that they have are not the same. We stay in line. We follow the guidance. We keep, um, we keep our head on our shoulders. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu Matzilenu Mi Adam. We do our part and then Hashem will do His. So, I think we understand now our paragraph. Tzeumad. <clears throat> in a way, Paro is, is a villain. But Lavan is a worse villain. And Lavan is here on the Seder. Because of someone like him, that's why we ended up in Mitzrayim to begin with. Paro is only the result. Paro is, the only, Paro is only physically. How do we even end up in Paro's hands? Why were we sent down to Mitzrayim? The answer is because of people like Lavan. And they're all around. They're all around us. Lavan, his name is White. Because Lavan means White. He didn't show you that he was a bad guy. He sat there, he was very polite and politically correct, and friendly, and it looked like there was nothing wrong with him. It was very white, Rabbi, there's nothing wrong. There's beautiful people, nothing wrong with it. What's the problem? The problem is we have to make our fence, we have to create our barriers, or else we're gonna realize that Arami uh, Ove Davi, he's gonna just try to destroy us, maybe not in a physical way, but in a worse way, in a spiritual way. Hashem should save us, and all of Am Yisrael from this uh, spiritual destruction that's going on today. We should be zochet to stay connected to our roots forever and ever and ever. Amen. We'll see everybody tomorrow. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Bye-bye.